morning. It is it's great to be with you. Um, many of you might not know who I am, but I actually first came uh, to your church when your church wasn't here. Uh, it was when it was in a high school uh, down the road, and it is so cool to see all that God has done in just a handful of years where you have grown and multiplied and reached a ton of people for Jesus and this amazing facility that God has given you and your really cool new front lawn. That's awesome. I live in New England. A front lawn is a complete waste of time where I live because it's warm for 15 minutes a year. But here, it makes total sense. So this is, this is really, really cool. I'm taking pictures and sending them all to my team. This is, this is fantastic. And of course, uh, you are blessed, I, I should say. I've known Pastor Paul for, uh, for quite some time. He and his amazing wife, Farah, were actually part of the team that led the church planting assessment that, that I took part in as a participant um, before we ever moved to Boston. I, li- I live in Boston, Massachusetts, um, which is kind of like here, except the people are angrier. Uh, and there's a Dunkin' Donuts. You can see the next one from each Dunkin' Donuts, which confuses the heck out of me. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so we moved there um, about 14 years ago. We'd been living in Great Britain for five years. I helped plant a couple of churches there, got bitten by the church planting bug and by the nerdy kind of academic bug, and so we moved to Boston to help people find and follow Jesus. Uh, the first congregation that we planted of Aletheia Church, which is the name of the church that I pastor, is right in Cambridge, Massachusetts, about half a mile between Harvard down that way and MIT down that way. So I bid you greetings from the People's Republic of Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> it's nice to be here in America again. Um, if you have a Bible, <laughs> you, can, you can open it up to the book of Habakkuk. If you don't know where the book of Habakkuk is, you can open your Bible up to the book of Table of Contents and find the book of Habakkuk. And while you do that, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce my family to you. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a collector of people, and these are some of them. Uh, uh, the first person that I managed to collect is my wife. We are high school sweethearts. I met her in math class. Uh, she was in the front row. She got an A. I was three rows behind her. I got a C. But I did get her, so I won. And then we started making disciples the old-fashioned way. Um, my oldest child uh, on the top left, that's a time-release joke. It takes a minute to get around the room. <laughs> Oldest child on the top left is Alana. She uh, just graduated from high school. She's, uh, she's amazing. Yeah, you can clap for that. I'm, mo- Mom and I are like, up top, we did it. Um, she's going to uh, Gordon College next fall. I'm going to study clinical psychology and all kinds of cool stuff. She plays the violin. She's incredibly artistic. She's great. This is her younger sister, Nora, is uh, going to go to college the following year, but she just started driving, which is, I mean, guys, I feel like my life is getting upgraded. I have an Uber driver that I don't have to pay. It's great. <laughs> It's great. She filled up gas for the first time the other day. She was like, did you know how expensive gas is? And I was like, <laughs> now you know. Um, it's great. It's great. Uh, my son, Cole, on the top right, he, is, uh, he plays for the Boston Youth Symphony, but he also plays baseball, and he doesn't want either of those two groups of people to know that the other group exists. Um, uh, he's a nerd about the Boston Red Sox. He can tell you everything about them that you would possibly want to know and a whole bunch of stuff you don't want to know. Um, and then this is Wyatt on the bottom left. He plays the cello. We're music nerds. We needed an instrument that would hold him down because um, he's, he's kind of crazy. Uh, so he is the exclamation point at the end of our child having career. Uh, so th- this is my family, and um, at some point I would love to bring them all to see you. Uh, but today they're here via picture. Um, I'm really honored to get to be with you today because I want to speak to you about a book that I wrote called When God Seems Gone. That group of people that you saw on that screen right there, um, they look great in that picture. But for a really long season of time, about seven or eight years within the history of our family, uh, a couple of them were struck with an incredibly difficult uh, medical condition, that the details of which are unimportant right now. But the point is, we went through a long, arduous season of intense suffering, far worse than I ever thought my family would ever go through. And, and in that season, I did what Christians do. I used my faith. I remember the first 18 months or so, um, I fasted every day. And not that I didn't eat for 18 months, but part or all of every day. I just was like, all right, I'm going to beat on the doors of heaven. And for years, it felt like 
I was doing all the talking. I don't know if you've ever been there where you've experienced what feels like the silence of heaven. Not because you believe that God's actually not there. I reckon, I mean, this is a church, which is typically where we find Christians. So I imagine most of you, like if we did a doctrinal belief test, you would check the box that says, I believe that God exists and that God is there, right? So when he's silent, that can make the problem so much worse. So the book that I wrote was, how, how do we get through seasons when it's, it feels like God seems gone. And today I want to talk to you particularly about the phenomenon of what ex the experience of God's silence. So we're going to read you from two chunks of text today. Uh, one is from the book of Habakkuk, which I'm sure most of you were probably reading and thinking about on your way here. And then the other is from the book of Psalms. I have a tradition in my church, and I'm wondering if you can make me feel a little bit at home. Uh, you can sit when I talk, but when the word of God is read, I ask my church to stand. So would you mind standing for the reading of the word of the Lord today? If you are able. Thanks. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise, so the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so that justice is perverted. Our next reading comes from the book of Psalms, a very short psalm, Psalm 131. It says this, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great or too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray for us. Holy Spirit, speak to your people. Speak through the word. Speak through my words. God, would you unstop deaf ears, open blind eyes, and soften hard hearts so that we can see that even when it feels like you're being quiet, we can still trust in your good providence. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. This experience of God's silence is, uh, it can have many effects. Personally, it can have the effect of denuding your faith. If you don't have an answer of what to do when, when you've been praying for something and praying for something and praying for something and you're just not hearing anything, if, if you can't admit that to yourself and you don't know what to do in response to that, then one of the First negative outcomes that can happen is that you just start to lose your love for God. Imagine my married men and women in the room. If your wife or your husband just didn't talk to you for years, that might make date night awkward, right? Make raising the kids a little difficult. Make living within the budget hard to do if you can't actually communicate. If you feel like you're the only one talking and you're literally getting nothing back, that can be a really difficult situation and might have negative impacts on your marriage, right? Like, I don't have any degrees in psychology, but even I know you should probably talk to each other. On the other hand, if we don't have an answer for what we'll do when God seems silent, it will denude our passion for other people. It'll denude our passion to say that, that Christ loves you, that Christ can save you, that Christ can redeem you, that Christ wants to do something amazing in your life, that you should come and lay down everything and follow Jesus Christ as his disciple that can denude our passion to, as you say in this church, help ordinary people live extraordinary lives. Because if you yourself aren't too hot on God, then your invitation isn't going to be all that compelling. Come, follow Jesus. I'm miserable. You should be too. Like, you shouldn't... That doesn't leap off the page, do you know? So what do we do when God seems silent? In this text that we read, we actually get some real clues. Now, about the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is, uh, is kind of a nobody. We don't know anything about Habakkuk except that he's a guy named Habakkuk who wrote down his prophetic lament to the Lord. Habakkuk, uh, we, we, he just shows up in the text, and then he's gone. 
We know that he's living around the 7th century B.C. before uh, the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel, and, and he's looking at his nation, the people that he loves, and watching their love for Jesus and watching their, their love for one another fall away, watching them wander into idolatry, watching a, a nation that God set out with his own hands fall apart and fall away, and he's crying out to them. And we know that he's been crying out to them for a long time because his text opens with, how long, O Lord, shall I cry for help? You don't say that if you haven't been doing it for a minute. My man hasn't been praying like, Lord, uh, just before I eat this meal, um, also help my nation. Amen. That's not, he's been in a place of prayer that you have to hurt to go to. He's been in a place of prayer that only pain and challenge and an insurmountable obstacle can get you to. And, and I got to tell you, like some of you are really young, and, and you're like, well, I've never been there. Let me prophesy to you for a moment. It's an oft overlooked promise of Jesus. In this life, you will suffer. I know none of you have that on your cool Christian tattoo. No coffee mugs with that one, no bumper stickers in the parking lot. In this life, you will suffer. Have a nice day. But it's a promise. He said, you will. But take heart, he says, because I've overcome the world. I want to show you how in God's sovereign silence, we can still trust in God's good providence. Now, Habakkuk had been praying and entreating God for quite some time, but had gotten nothing back. Now, when God is silent and isn't talking back to you, when God seems gone, there's two reasons. One is really simple and one is really uh, not difficult, or not simple. It's very textured and, and, and challenging. So let's get the simple one out of the way. Sin. If you are in flagrant sin, if you are in rebellion against God, if you are doing what you want to do and trying to call yourself a Christian and God feels far away, stop acting surprised. Stop acting surprised. If I'm flagrantly sinning against my wife, Right? If I like step out, if I like spend all the money, if I commit adultery, and then I act surprised that she doesn't want to chat with me or go on date night, you're going to act surprised that I'm acting surprised. Right? But I'm constantly surprised how many people in my own church, I'm going to tell on them because they're not here right now, how many people in my own church will come to me and say, God feels far away, Pastor. What do I do? Okay, well, tell me, like, are you reading the text? Are you praying? Like, are you in a small No. Okay? How, how's, your, how's your participation in church? Well, I come to church every, I don't know, vernal equinox or something. Like, I show up whenever, and I'm like, okay, well, you're not doing the things Jesus wants you to do. You're not saying the things he wants you to say. You're not reading the text that he left for you, and you're not following him with his people. And you want me to answer the question, why he seems far away. I feel like you can do that. And my prayer at this moment isn't going to help you all that much unless it's followed by repentance on your part. So I just got to say that up front as a disclaimer. If God seems gone and you've done left him, that's why. But that's not what I wrote the book about. If you're trusting Jesus, and you're showing up, and you're serving on one of these teams, and you're in your small groups, and you're seeking God, but you're just walking through something super challenging, and God seems gone, what are you going to do then? That's what I want to show you, that when God seems gone, and it's sovereign silence, you can still trust in his good providence. Now, what do I mean by sovereign silence? In this case, what I mean here is that God is intentionally withholding his voice for a season from a guy like Habakkuk because God wants to show Habakkuk something that he could not otherwise have shown him. God is never only doing one thing. God's silence is never accident accidental, and it's never because he is giving you the silent treatment. He's not like you, right? You've all done this in a relationship. You're mad at somebody, your friend, your spouse, whatever. They come in and say, hey, what's, what's, what's wrong? You're like, nothing. And you look longingly off into the distance, like you're about to break out in some Broadway song about what is in fact wrong. <laughs> and then you just don't talk. God's not doing that, okay? He's not a drama queen or king. No, God, God's sovereign silence is meant to do something and build something within us. It's sovereign because it's it's filled and pregnant with intentionality and with purpose, even when we cannot understand what it is because God is doing something in the long game. 
You've got to understand that God is always working a trillion angles. Even in the situation of sickness in my family or even in the situation of difficulty in your job or the challenge you might be having with one of your children or the difficulty that you're experiencing and whatever it is that God has called you to do, in those moments when you're praying and you're not getting the immediate voice back, it might be because God is doing something in you beyond what you were able to see and understand. And that's exactly what God's answer ended up being to Habakkuk. In verse 5, which we didn't read, God actually answers back. I wonder if Habakkuk expected this. Probably not, which is why he wrote it down. He's been out and com- complaining, lamenting, having, having a chat, a yell with the Lord, talking to him about his nation. And finally the Lord says, all right, look among the nations And wonder and be astounded, for I'm doing a work in your days that you would not believe if you were told. Now, some of you, you recognize that verse, right? Not at me. Oh, yeah, I'm doing something in your days that you would not believe if you were told. That sounds exciting, right? It wasn't. It was awful. What God was doing, if you read the rest of the book, is sovereignly raising up a nation called Assyria to come and discipline his people. Do you think Habakkuk could have possibly understood that? Do you think Habakkuk could have possibly understood that he was doing that in order to discipline his people so that they could go into exile, so that they could feel what it would feel like for for them to go back into the exodus that God had delivered them from, back into slavery that God had delivered them from, so that he could set up all of the historical conditions necessary to bring about Messiah? No. I recently, last month, you know, was doing my taxes me and TurboTax having a date, just me and Uncle Sam hanging out in my office upstairs in my house. And my, my youngest son, Wyatt, came up and he was like, Dad, I want to hang out. I'm like, man, I would love to hang out with you, but I'm currently hanging out with the tax man, so we'll hang out later. All afternoon. He's like, Dad, come on, what are you doing? When I was asked by him, what am I doing? Do you think I could have answered him very detailed? Do you think I could have taken out my, I don't know, 100 plus page tax return, which I, why is it so complicated? I'm a pastor, it shouldn't be, anyway. If I'd sat him down with my tax return and explained carried interest and amortization (laughs) and taken out the tax code, which is five times the length of Holy Scripture, and referenced all the laws, and like, and like actually explain to my 11-year-old what I was doing, do you think he would have gotten it? No. But how often do we do this with the Lord? How often do you and I say, look, I'll trust you, just show me your work. God, where are you? God, what are you doing? God, I need... Oftentimes, we come to him wanting the answer of his explanation when what we really need is the experience of our own growth and sanctification and trust in him, even when he does not give us the immediate feedback that we once experienced in that powerful moment of worship or that we once experienced at that time that we got saved or filled with the Holy Spirit. And we want the same experience because we want the dopamine hit and the nice warm fuzzles and the like liver quiver or whatever it is that you think is spiritual, but is probably just a really well-mixed kick drum. Whatever that is, we want that. And we're mad when we don't get it. And maybe, just maybe, God was developing me into a different kind of man in those years. And maybe, just maybe, in those moments when God seems like he's not answering in the way that you want him to, maybe it's not angry silence or bitter silence. Maybe it's sovereign silence. Because in God's sovereign silence, we can still trust in his good providence. God was still governing all of the affairs of global politics. God was still governing all of the affairs of the ancient Near East. God was still getting his will done, his plan to bring Messiah, his plan to save the world. God was still at work even when he seemed absent. I need you to hear this, Rivers Crossing, because if, if you don't, it'll be really hard for you to do this mission that your church has printed everywhere. You can't call people to an extraordinary life if you tell them it's always going to be up and to the right. It's always going to be awesome. Yeah, yeah, come, come to church, come to Jesus, and whatever you're experiencing now, it's just next year is going to be more money and like a better body, and like eventually your hair could even grow back. Just let's go. <laughs> My hair has gone before me to prepare a place for me. <laughs> that is my bald pastor joke. It is the one I own. You are welcome. God's sovereign silence is just that. It's filled with purpose. And we have to be able to say that when our friends 
when our neighbors, when our nation suffers. And, and, and God maybe is doing something that we, frankly, wish he wouldn't do. In God's sovereign silence, we can still trust in his good providence. That is how Habakkuk ends. By the end of the book of Habakkuk, we don't get Habakkuk having been given all of the answers that he wants, but he lifts up his voice and he says, I trust you. That's what we get in the book of Psalms. Psalm 31, or 131, that we just read, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and marvelous for me, but I've calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. This is the kind of picture that every mom gets. When that baby is new, cry, immediate response. Cry, immediate response. Cry, immediate response. But at some point, that child is going to have to learn that when it cries, it can't have mom right away. Because if it doesn't, it will turn into an adult who can't handle it when he or she doesn't get what he or she wants. At some point in the process of weaning, the child learns, I know my mom is here, even though she's not responding to me right away. So like a child that's been weaned, I'm going to still and quiet my soul. This is not the way of complaint, my friends. This is the way of mature lament, and we are not good at that. L lament is not something that the American evangelical charismatic church is known for doing. It's not even something that Protestants, since like 1517, that we've been a brand, it's not something that we're known for doing. Most of our songs are in major keys. If you go on CCLI right now, which is the Christian licensing instrument for all Christian music, and you just look up songs of lament, you'll find that it's about 1% of the bajillion songs on CCLI. And if you try to find songs in minor keys, which for those of you that aren't music nerds, minor keys are the sad ones, okay? If you try to find a song that just is sad, to worship God to, you won't find much. They're all over the Psalms, though. Properly a third or a fourth of this book of hymns and poems inside your Bible is in a minor key. Why? Because the Bible understands that life is hard and sometimes God seems gone and wants to arm you not just with songs of praise to tell God how beautiful and wonderful he is, but songs of lament so that when it stinks down here, you are still able to worship him and talk to him. Now, some of you are like, oh, I do that. No, I don't mean whining. I don't mean complaining. And I don't mean taking off on a social media rant about those people and those Christians at those churches. I see you. Right? More terrifyingly, you know that God reads what you put on social media, right? Ha 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 Laughs awkwardly. Move on, Pastor. All right. Yeah, it, we've got to learn as a people of God, I've got to learn as a man of God, that I can, even when God seems silent, and I'm not getting the feedback that I wish I was getting, I can come to him with lament and go, God, this sucks. I hate this. I don't understand this. And I could really use your voice right here. My words are doing nothing. My help is doing nothing. My strength is doing nothing. My faith is doing nothing. I need the guy who spoke the stars into all existence to come and speak to this problem, please. You know you can talk to God like that. In my, in my office, I've got, I live in a very old house because uh, it's Boston. And so my house was built 140 years ago. And so we have these chimneys that run all the way from the basement to the top floor, which is where my office is. And so I, I have this figure eight that I walk and pray. You can see the carpet is all laid down of all these patterns that I've made, talking, lamenting, yelling at God. You know he can handle that, right? He wants you to talk to him even in those moments when it feels like he's not talking back. Do you know why? This isn't in my notes, but I feel it's important to say to some of you. There's a kind of prayer you pray that's only drawn out when God doesn't speak immediately back to you. There's a kind of intimacy that he wishes to have with some of you that won't occur until he waits for you to get past the shallow, Lord, thank you for my day, and if you could bless my money, that would be great, and uh, my kids, uh, the house, um, the church, uh, 
it takes a minute to dig a little deeper, to pull something out of your soul that God really wants to talk to you about. When God seems silent, we can still trust in his good providence. That's what the psalmist is telling us. He's telling God that he's decided to no longer anxiously occupy his thoughts with all of the what-ifs about God's plans or his character or his ways. He's no longer going to cry when he can't see his mom. Rather, he's learned to quiet his soul just like a baby that has finally been weaned. He's going to grow up a little bit. He's going to learn to trust God. Even in a season when God isn't saying what he wish he would say, and you say, well, okay, Adam, that's, that sounds really heavy. How, how do I, how, why would I trust that you that I, I should do that? Oh, you shouldn't. You should trust Jesus. Because if there's anyone who knows what the soul-crushing experience of the silence of heaven feels like, it's your Jesus. It was a night in the Garden of Gethsemane that he's praying. He's talking to God. And I, listen, I, in a, my other job is that I'm a, I'm a seminary professor and a New Testament professor. I'm a nerd, okay? I collect degrees. Like, they're, it's a problem. This story of Jesus in the garden messes with me the more I read it. It's like the Bible is putting me in some weird jujitsu arm lock. Like, I can't. Because here we have the Son of God the one by whom all things were made and for whom all things exist and in whom all things hold together. Speaking to his father about something that in his humanity he wishes were different. If that doesn't mess with you, you haven't thought about it hard enough. He submits to God's will and he goes to the cross and then on the cross he cries out, Eli, Eli, Lama sabachthani, Lord, my God, my God, where are you? Where are you? Where did you go? And for what must have felt like a soul-crushing eternity, the Son of God experienced the silence of God so that sinners could be called sons and daughters of God. I'm not suggesting for a moment that the Trinity broke or something like that because if Jesus is quoting Psalm 22 and at the end of Psalm 22 he says very, very clearly that this, this crying out is to be done in faith to the God who, who hears and delivers. He says this, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to worship the Lord and all of the families of the nations shall worship before you, for kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. Jesus is crying out in his pain in a moment where God isn't talking back, filled with faith by wielding the word, not whining in his flesh. So what do you do when God seems silent? What do you do when God seems gone? Christian, four things I want to encourage you to do. When God seems silent, first, don't return the favor. When God seems silent, don't return the favor. Remember, God's silence is always filled with his providence and filled with his sovereignty. He's doing something. He's always doing something. So when you feel like he's not talking to you back, you better not shut your mouth. You better keep knocking. Remember, the one who asks, seeks, and knocks will find. Okay, those are present, active, indicative imperatives. Here's what that means. It doesn't mean you knocked once. No, I didn't answer, and then you walk away. It means the one who knocks and 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 keeps knocking. That's your command in mind. We're to ask and keep asking, knock and keep knocking, seek and keep seeking. Two, when God seems silent, don't listen to the accuser. James 4, 7 says, resist, resist the devil and he will flee from you. There will come a time in God's silence where the, the evil one will come and, and he'll start accusing God, you see? You're not really a man of God. See, you're not really a woman of God. See, God doesn't really answer you. He doesn't really care about you. You have to resist the voice of the accuser. The third thing you must do is that when God seems silent, restate what he's already said. Listen, I love these moments of worship. I love being in buildings like this, and your band is flipping amazing, and, and I love that. But l- if you want God to speak to you here, and you refuse to listen to what he has said to you here, you won't hear him correctly. Because you can hear all kinds of things in your soul's ear. It might be your voice. 
It might be the burrito you had for lunch. It could be a memory. It could be the devil himself. How do you know the warp and woof of God's voice? How do you know his accent? How do you know the nature and the pace of his speech? Because you saturate yourself in the story of Scripture, and you learn what your father sounds like. Because the Bible says, you and I, we see through glass dimly. We hear with stuffed up ears. We don't get it all fully. we got to have this. So when God seems silent to your spiritual ear, restate what he's already said. That's what Jesus did. That's why he quoted Psalm 22 in his moment of deep, deep suffering. And finally, when God seems silent, listen for his voice from a new source. I gotta tell you, God's voice, it sounds an awful lot like Mrs. Mabry sometimes. God's voice sounds an awful lot like some of my best friends in ministry sometimes. Because God is speaking to me, not through the way I wish, but through the way I need. When God seems silent, and sometimes He will seem silent to you, oh my friends, how I want you to understand that in His sovereign silence, you and I can still trust in his good providence. Let me pray for us. Lord, I'm asking that you would help make my friends in this room today robust, strong, and deep. Lord, there are men and women in the room today for whom it feels like they're going through the motions of religiosity, but they haven't heard the voice of God. Lord, I pray that they would hear the voice. I pray that they would have deep spiritual experiences, but Lord, may you have your perfect work in this season of sovereign silence. And Lord, for my friends in here who are not yet followers of Jesus today, I'm asking that you would move on their hearts in such a way as to show them that there is a God who hears. He hears so well that the cry of humanity arose to his ears and he sent his son Jesus to experience the brokenness and tragedy of human suffering and sin and then hand over for free the grace and mercy of God's forgiveness. Oh Lord, work powerfully today. Move in this room. Pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.